things not too bumpy as we move along this morning in our study. Um, I've done a couple of changes in our class. I put most of our uh, scripture readings, I put them on the PowerPoint. Um, and it's kind of <clears throat> maybe more for my purpose. Um, because then when you're called upon to read, you'll be looking up at the screen. And due to the fact that as uh, I get a little older, the sound of my truck rings more in my ears than it used to. And it makes it harder for me to hear. So I thought I'd try that. We'll see how it goes. If, if uh, everyone uh, is happy with it, then fine. I'll... Uh, keep doing it that way, but we'll see what, how things go. So in our uh, New Testament overview lessons, we've looked now at, uh, at the four Gospels. We've looked at the four Gospels, and we uh, looked at the early history of the Lord's Church found in Acts, and then we moved into the epistles or letters, which began with Romans, and have continued on through First and Second Corinthians. And we are now in Galatians. Uh, Galatians is the ninth book of the New Testament. And the epistles, if you remember, are written for patterns or instructions to, to various churches or individual Christians. And this epistle is the only one that is addressed to a, a plurality of churches. We read that in Galatians 1 and 2. Few books in the Bible have made such a lasting impression upon men's minds as has this epistle of Paul. To the Galatians. This book, like Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians, maintains that man is justified by grace through faith, separate and apart from the works of the Mosaic Law. And consequently, Galatians uh, had a tremendous influence on first century Christians. At first, men viewed Christians as just another sect of the Jews, uh, somewhat similar to the Pharisees and the, the Sadducees, the Herodians and the, the Zealots. But the impact of the revelation that man is justified through Jesus Christ without circumcision and obedience to the law of Moses gradually modified this perception of Christianity. And preaching this gospel to the Gentiles and Jews alike signaled a major turning point, and Christianity became a world religion separate from Judaism. And at this point, Mike Willis makes a comment in his commentary on Galatians, and I quote, he says, from the time that Christianity was perceived as a non-Jewish religion, it ceased to enjoy the privileges that the Roman government granted an approved religion. Consequently, he says, Christians were now liable to government persecution. I thought that was interesting. Maybe the Roman government needed to know that it was God who gave us 
his word and not them. But I thought that was kind of interesting. So Paul's letter to the Galatians contributed tremendously to the early development of Christianity. And along with Romans, it continues even today in helping to establish the concept of justification through faith in Jesus Christ, apart from the works of the Mosaic Law. And in our map here, just kind of showing where the Galatia province was, it was a Roman province in Asia Minor, and it was located where now lies modern-day Turkey. And it took its name from the Gauls. They were a, a Celtic people who, uh, after waging war in, in southern, southeastern Europe, they were driven out and they crossed over into Asia Minor, creating a homeland for themselves. And secular history says that they were famous for their courage and their enthusiasm but also equally so for their quick impressions, uh, for their sudden changes and fickleness. They were also hospitable and generous. So let's now look into the origin of Galatians, and we'll begin, as always, with the title. And we start off with question number seven, and the, our first reading is, is 10 verses. Um, so maybe I'll, I didn't put that on the screen, but we'll read that. And I'll see if uh, John and Lillian, if you would split that reading up, five verses each. Galatians 1, verses 1 to 10. Paul an apostle, not from men, nor through men, but through Jesus Christ, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. <clears throat> Grace and peace from God the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who have troubled you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any gospel to you that other than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. For do I know, for, for I'm sorry, for, for do I now persuade man or God or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Thank you, John Lowe. So as we see at the beginning of those verses, it's an inspired circular letter for several churches okay, in this province of Galatia. Paul and Barnabas, if you recall, evangelized and organized churches in this area on Paul's first missionary trip. Remember those, that's all recorded in Acts 13 and, and 14. And we, uh, I put a, a little map up here to show us these churches. If you see uh, Antioch of Pisidia, uh, it's up in, uh, the middle there, and then we have Iconium, um, and Lystra, and Derby. And these are the churches that uh, Paul visited, organized, 
on that first trip. And we find that all in, in Acts 13 and, and 14. So I want us to go back to our reading. I want us to take note of something in verses 2 and 3. Paul said there, And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder, why do you think Paul mentions his unnamed brethren? Any thoughts on that? Yes, Tom? Possibly, possibly because of persecution, right? Uh, may make them known to the authorities. That, yes, good point. Never thought of that. Can you think of the reason that he's writing this letter to the Galatians is that he is, he is making a point here. He's going to teach them. But any other thoughts on why that might have been? What I had thought of was that he wanted others to know that there are other brethren included in this household of faith. Um, and they trust Paul's character. They trust his teaching. In other words, it was to encourage them to have them sit up and, and listen. And, and respect who Paul was. Um, I just thought that was kind of interesting because it's at the beginning of most of his books, he, he doesn't put that in there. But he also, he combines two ideas here of grace and peace. And he does that, I think, in all of his uh, letters, I believe. Um, but any ideas why he might put that in there? Grace and peace often go together. You can't have peace without grace. Grace being favor uh, from God, and we can have grace as well. What, what? So if, if, if we go hand in hand, you, if you have grace, you will have peace. You really can't have peace if there is no grace. Right. So, right. Uh, that'd be where yeah. I am. That's no, that's a good point. Everyone has different thoughts, really. Yeah, and I think too, <coughs> uh, Paul uh, is always giving the Lord Jesus Christ the credit, the mm -hmm. peace and the grace that they can abound in, and it causes them to continually thank God for Christ Jesus. So it doesn't takes it away from the physical man and puts it on the spiritual aspect of Jesus Christ. Exactly. Maybe. Yeah, we see that your point in, in his defense all through of who he is when he tries to um, get them to understand who he is. He's an apostle, but he always, you're right, accepts Jesus ahead of that. Um, but I was, I was thinking too that he would, kind of like what Lillian said, he wants to have his readers understand that the true message of salvation is based solely on God's grace. Because right now, these Galatians are being told otherwise. Okay? And, and maybe Paul had that thought. But that salvation is based solely on God's grace. Galatians 1 and 6 that we just read, Paul says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. There was the reason for the calling from God, because of the grace of Jesus. And Galatians 2 and 21, let me, Lord, you read that, please. Galatians 2 and 21? Yeah, you can read it on the screen or out of your Bibles, whatever you want. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Okay, so those two verses show us that it's God's grace, the salvation, and it's received by faith. <clears throat> Ephesians 2 and 8. Paul. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Okay, so this grace and our faith provides, like Jeremy just mentioned, provides peace with God. Okay? Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so those thoughts that we all said that grace and peace remind us, huh? Uh, Bill, you know uh, that we have peace with God through faith. And, or, you know, and through grace, you know, it's interesting to me that previous uh, slide that you had, uh, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Well, grace isn't just some nebulous thing that floats in the air, and if we do the best we can, then we're going to be right, but faith has two ingredients. It's faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of the God, Romans 10, 17, but also in, uh, uh, my mind just went blank, uh, in uh, James' letter, he says, though the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So the idea is that we have, if we have to have, if we have to have uh, peace with God, right. then we have to be obedient to the gospel, and then when we're obedient to the gospel, then we have the grace of God, if Amen. that makes sense. Yeah, well, exactly. And, and we've seen that, you know, as I was starting to do this lesson, I thought, my goodness, why is it so hard for people to understand justification through faith by the grace of God? When we just studied that with Jeremy all through Romans and all through First and Second Corinthians. And still... Then we need another book to, to teach. You know, yeah. just amazing. You mentioned uh, Romans, you know, Romans 5 identifies or instructs us what grace is all about. He says, yeah, I can't, I get foggy when I, uh, therefore having been justified by faith, there it is. If you want to, if you want to have grace, uh, if you want to have, be justified, you have to have faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access by faith into grace. So you only access grace through faith. Exactly. And faith is an active word. Yeah. You know, and so if you want to have God's grace, and you have to have faith, and if you have to hear, and you have to believe and obey. Exactly. We have to accept it, don't we? And to accept it, we have to take it. You know. But of course, we take it in the direction that God's given us. Um, that's a good point. So, if we go back. Just got to make sure I hit the right buttons here. We go back here now, and we'll answer the second part of this question. Why was it necessary for the Apostle Paul to write to them? If you look at verse 6, why did Paul write this letter to the Galatians? What was the reason? They were already being influenced by the Jewish nation to withdraw from him and to turn their back against the, the gospel. Right. They were deserting, deserting him who called them by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Okay, they were deserting God. They were leaving him behind. And as I was reading that, I, I had the thought, well, who called the, the Galatians? In the very beginning, who, who called them? Who called you? Jesus Christ. Okay. Right, well, right. We'll have to do, I thought we had that figured out, but it didn't. Um, Lisa, do you want to read this verse, Ephesians 1 and 18? Sorry, Philippians 3 and 14. Yeah. 
Yes. Okay. So the thought was, who called us? You know, everybody, it seems, has a different calling, don't they? They have different stories of how God called them. Well, we're told here, or who called them, we're told here that God calls us in Jesus Christ. And Philippians, uh, uh oh. Ephesians 1 and 18. Uh, Henry, you can read it off the screen. Or... I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Philippians 3 and 14 told us that God calls us, and who's the his in this verse? What is the hope of his calling? Who's, who's the his? But God, praise. It's God who calls. And it's a, it's a holy calling. Okay? It's a heavenly calling. It's a calling of hope. 2 Timothy Verse 1 and 9. Uh, Jonathan, you want to read that, please? Uh, who has saved us and called us with a uh, holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus our Father. Okay, these verses remind us who called us, where that calling comes from, the calling of hope, and it occurs through 2 Thessalonians 2 and 14. Um, and do you want to read that? Do it for this, because, because you know our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Just the thought that occurred to me here to remind those that sometimes we study with, God himself calls us. And that should cause us to be moved. We're the creation. The creator calls us, and he calls us only one way, through the preaching of the gospel. Um, and I just thought that those are, he doesn't call men any other way than through the grace of Christ as manifested in the gospel. And as we will see in this book, the Judaizers were leading the Galatians away from the grace of Christ, away from the reason that Christ was sent. And they were leading them to a system of legal justification through perfect obedience to the law of Moses. And this is what Paul is ready to tackle with here, with the, the, church in Gal the churches in Galatia. They were leaving the one that first called them. It's always sometimes good to check our thinking when at first we are moved by the gospel of Christ and we realize what the Bible has, has said to us, we realize and understand that the only way to receive the forgiveness of our sins is through obedience to Christ. And then yet, as time goes on, someone will come with a different theory or doctrine, and we're led astray. You know, I, I believe that it's like 27 years from AD 30, when the church was established, and we see how soon right. these brethren were being led away, like you say, by the Judaizers. Yeah. And so if you multiply that by 2,000 years, you can see what, you know, I was talking to Jehovah's Witness down our way, and I know all of us have from time to time, and 
they would even agree that there's like 1,200 churches in the U.S., you know, and, and that, and it's why, because people are just led away from the simplicity that's in the gospel. And a passage that comes to my mind, if I could read one, could I? Yeah. In Ephesians 4, you know, where, where the Apostle Paul, he basically says what you've been saying in a different way. He says he is, you know, where he established the church in in verse 11, he gave himself to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and some uh, pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, that we should all be, that we should all come to unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure and the stature and the fullness of Christ. And then I just read that to say this, that in verse 14, he says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. You know, so I think that kind of fits, and like you said, I think he says it maybe in a little different way. It, it does, it does fit. We often wonder, if, is, it, is it maybe pride that man does that? Man, we think we can find a, a different way, a better way. I don't know. It's uh, why our thinking is is swayed. Not, of course, it's a lot to do with the power of the devil. He leads us along. Maybe it's pride. I don't know. It's just I found it amazing after our, our study of Romans of First, Second Corinthians that this thought in, in, in Paul's years of preaching would still be floating around, and it's here today. You know, but we leave the the title section now, and uh, we move. Uh oh, now I thought. Uh, what they do? No, we'll have to do it one at a time. I set this up, and I thought. It would go smoothly, but as I've often said, when I was in school, computers were the size of pickup trucks, and <laughs> we never were brought up in that era. But anyway, we'll move on to the author section. And uh, our question here, Dave asks us, is how do the following passages provide confirmation in support of Paul as the author of Galatians. And again, I put the scriptures up on the screen, so if you want to read them from the screen, looking up, fine, if not. So Galatians 1, 13 to 14, 10. Do you want to read that, please? For oh, you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism. How I used to persecute the church of God, the young major and try to destroy it. When I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely jealous of my ancestors' traditions. Okay. Who is speaking here? Paul. Paul? Yes, Paul. Paul. Now, anyone familiar with Paul's conduct prior to his conversion, if you remember Acts 22, verse 3, and then Acts 8, 1 to 3, in both those passages, anyone that's familiar with what Paul was like before his conversion would know that this was not a time when someone was preaching him the gospel. He was busy dragging off Christians to prison, um, working with the Pharisees and scribes, finding out who these people were, and Paul was, was dragging them off. Um, so we see that this had to be Paul speaking here. And in Galatians 1, 15 to, to 17, um, do you want to read? Uh, so when God, 
but sent me a card even from my mother's room and called me through Drake to his face. He revealed his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. So I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Okay, thank you, Casey. Who is this speaking of? This passage. Paul, oh, right? Right. Remember Acts 9. In Acts chapter 9, the first 25 verses, we have this biblical story, don't we? Um, the road to Damascus. God chose Paul. Christ was revealed to Paul on that road. And, and Paul retold this whole experience um, before the council, didn't he? Uh, and King Agrippa. Um, so it had to be Paul. Who else? You know, that's an incredible thought that, you know, he had set me apart from my mother's womb. God planned even probably before Paul was born that, that he was going to be a, an apostle to the Gentiles. What if? What if Paul, Paul's mother said, well, I'm just going to abort this child? Wow. You know, uh, like so much today that, and other famous people that if they had been aborted, we wouldn't have all these works. We'd be less the half the New Testament. Exactly, John. Good point, yeah. Yeah, and the fact that this was planned, wasn't it? From the beginning, which also tells me God knew what Paul was like, was going and, to be and, like. And it makes it more incredible from what you mentioned, what Paul had done before, you know, persecuting the Christians. I mean, if you had have said, well, this is a guy that uh, God chose, you'd think he's crazy, you know? Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And yet, look at what he endured um, afterwards, you know? It is amazing God's ways, you know, for us to have planned that out. We never would have, would we? Yeah, when Nora and I first obeyed the gospel, um, we were in that following, that was on a Sunday, on the following Wednesday night, we were in Bible class, and I, had, I knew nothing about some of the things that were going in the Bible for us. And there were, I had read a little bit of, uh, here and there about what Paul, how he talked about himself, yeah. And if you don't know Paul, if you, don't, if you haven't followed through the, the scriptures, and I thought, well, someone said, well, what do you think about Paul? I said, stupid, dumb little old me. He said, well, he sounds very vain and very conceited and very boastful. Until we, I understood the gospel, and then I realized what a man of strength and courage and yeah. confidence he was. But, you know, who would have known? Is there one greater than Paul? Isn't that what the gospel is? There's, he has just done so much to advance the gospel of Christ. So I prayed for forgiveness for thinking that Paul was such a vain man. Right. But he knew who he was and that God had chosen to put him in a, in a place where he would suffer yes. as well as fall way through. So it's, it's remarkable to read the books that Paul has written. Yeah. I often thought of his, his courage and desire for Judaism in the beginning. And, you know, then when Jesus appeared to him and his heart was changed, he, he lost the desire and the, the zeal for the one and put that into the grace, preaching the grace of Christ, didn't he? Well, but John has often said, you know, you don't want to leave your comfort zone to get involved with God's word. But he, he had it made. You know, yeah. he, was, he was doing very well in his secular life. But he gave that up to serve the Lord. Yeah. Not even looking back. That's a good point. That's a good point. So, um, well, we'll do one more. Jared said I got two minutes after that. They'll go. So Galatians uh, 2 and 1. Sandy, do you want to read that, please? Okay. Who 
is this? Who is this speaking of? Who did this? Remember, we're trying to prove the point, that confirm the point that Paul was the author. Um, who, after 14 years, went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas? Paul. Oh, right. Very right. We read that in, in Acts 11 and Corinthians 7. And Barnabas, Barnabas was well known to the Galatian and the Jerusalem brothers. And uh, in those passages in Acts and Corinthians, he took Paul aside after Paul's conversion and he presented Paul to the brethren at Jerusalem. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend.